It would be difficult to imagine a more authoritative speaker on urban landscapes than David Harvey. Harvey is a distinguished professor in the anthropology department at the City University in New York, where he has been since 2001. Prior to that, he was a professor of geography at both Oxford University and Johns Hopkins University. To describe him as one of the world's foremost geographers is to understate the breadth and influence of his work over many decades. Following his early landmark work, Explanation in Geography, he expanded his reach to broader issues of social injustice, offering a sustained critique of capitalist society over the course of many works. Social Justice in the City, published in 1973, was followed by Limits to Capital, 1982, and the groundbreaking The Condition of Postmodernity, a book that Terry Eagleton called, when it was published in 1989, the most brilliant study of postmodernism to date. While Spaces of Hope, published in 2000, imagines utopian alternatives to contemporary social reality, Harvey's 2003 book, The New Imperialism, suggests that the failures of capitalism are manifested in American political misadventures that seek to divert attention from them. A Brief History of Neoliberalism, published in 2005, was followed by his most recent book, Spaces of Global Capitalism, Toward a Theory of Uneven Geographical Development, just published in 2006. The title of tonight's lecture is Neoliberalism in the City, and Professor Harvey has agreed to take questions afterwards. We're very pleased to welcome David Harvey to Middlebury College. Thank you for that uh, warm welcome. My friends and uh, colleagues are actually quite mystified of my recent behavior because what I've been doing recently is reading all of George Bush's speeches. Uh, one of the reasons I've been doing this is because I've become fascinated uh, with a particular form of rhetoric which is contained in those speeches which is about freedom and liberty. Uh, he was actually making speeches on this topic uh, well before 2001, uh, but after 2001, this became a very strong theme. Uh, rarely did he ever make a speech without invoking notions of freedom and liberty. And as somebody who actually appreciates freedom and liberty, as I think many of you will, uh, it is, I think, useful to look at some of his rhetorical devices. On the anniversary of 9-11, he wrote a piece that appeared in the, as an op-ed piece in the New York Times, when he said, we are determined to stand for the values that gave our nation its birth because a peaceful world of growing freedom serves America's long-term interests, reflects enduring American ideals, and unites America's allies. He then went on to conclude that humanity now holds in its hands the opportunity f to further freedom's triumph over its age-old foes. And he then said, the United States welcomes its responsibility to lead in this great mission. Uh, he adapted this rhetoric partly in response to a speech given by Tony Blair uh, to Congress in January 2003. And Tony Blair said the following, there is a myth that though we love freedom, others don't, that our attachment to freedom is a product of our culture, that freedom, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, are American values or Western values. Members of Congress, ours are not Western values. They are universal values of the human spirit. Bush accepted this friendly amendment, and in his next speech he said this, the advance of freedom is the calling of our time. It is the calling of our country. From the 14 points, and he's referring back to Woodrow Wilson, to the four freedoms, he's referring back to Roosevelt, to the speech at Westminster, which was given by Ronald Reagan, America has put its power at the service of principle. We believe that liberty is the design of nature. We believe that liberty is the direction of history. We believe that human fulfillment and excellence come in the responsible exercise of liberty, and we believe the freedom we prize is not for us alone, it is the right and capacity of all mankind. 
Then in his acceptance speech before the Republican National Convention, he said the following, I believe America is called to lead the cause of freedom in a new century. I believe that millions in the Middle East plead in silence for their liberty. I believe that given the chance, they will embrace the most honorable form of government ever devised by man. I believe all these things because freedom is not America's gift to the world. It is the Almighty's gift to every man and woman in this world. And in his inaugural speech in 2005, he further consolidated this idea. He says, we go forward with complete confidence in the eventual triumph of freedom, not because history runs on the wheels of inevitability. It is human choices that move events. Not because we consider ourselves a chosen nation. God moves and chooses as he wills. While history has an ebb and flow of justice, it also has a visible direction set by liberty and the author of liberty. Now, the three points I would want to make about these speeches. The first is that there is a kind of shift, as you will see, from the idea that freedom and liberty are distinctively American values to the idea that they are distinctively human universal values to the idea that they are natural values to the idea that they are part of God's intelligent design for the world. That shift, I think, has its own dynamic and its own significance. But the second point I would want to make about it is this. It's very hard to take that rhetoric about liberty and freedom and then look at the pictures from Abu Ghraib, look at what's happening in Guantanamo Bay, look at what is being done through the Patriot Act, look at the circumscription of liberties which are going on, look at the way in which the United States is in alliance with, with states like Uzbekistan, uh, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, many other places where these notions of freedom and liberty are completely ignored. So there is, if you like, a tremendous gap between the rhetoric and the actuality. And there's a temptation, I think, on many people's parts as a result of this to take Bush's rhetoric about liberty and freedom and treat it as if it's just hot air, it's just hypocritical nonsense and therefore not worth discussing. On that point, I find myself partially in agreement with the conservative columnist in the New York Times, David Brooks, who was commenting on one of his speeches about liberty and freedom, who kind of went on to say this. We should not assume, he says, that the real America is the money-grubbing, resource-wasting, TV-drenched, unreflective bimbo of the earth, and that all this high-toned language is just a cover for the quest for oil or the desire for riches, dominion, or war. Now, I think actually America is all of those things, <laughs> but I think Brooks is quite right to insist that this rhetoric is not just a cover. It actually is serious, and it has serious echoes, and part of the politics of this country, I think, uh, comes out of uh, the history of those, those concepts. And I think the way that Bush referred back to Woodrow Wilson, to Roosevelt, to Reagan, sometimes he refers back to Kennedy as well, suggests that what Bush is engaged in here is not something that's an aberration. And I think one of the problems many of us have these days is we think that Bush is an aberration when I think that in some ways he's deeply, deeply representative of the American historical tradition. And in particular, he recites again and again Woodrow Wilson. And I think this harking back to Woodrow Wilson is important and significant. For instance, in his Whitehall speech, which he gave to the, to the British, he made much of the fact that he was the first president to sleep in Buckingham Palace since Woodrow Wilson. And he talked about Woodrow Wilson, an idealist, without question, he said, and he recounted that at a dinner hosted by King George V, Woodrow Wilson made a pledge, and this is Bush speaking, with typical American understatement, he vowed that right and justice would become the predominant and controlling force in the world. He then went on to say that right and justice which Americans took very seriously, had a long and honorable tradition. And he even made a sort of joking remark that he said, if we Americans are too concerned about freedom and liberty, it is because we have read too much John Locke and Adam Smith. Of course, it boggles the mind a little bit to imagine George Bush reading John Locke <laughs> and Adam Smith, but you see what he's getting at. <laughs> 
which is that there is a long tradition of this way of thinking, which, and he's situating himself against that background. And I think the Woodrow Wilson argument is significant because Woodrow Wilson made a following speech in 1919. He said this, since trade ignores national boundaries and the manufacturer insists on having the world as a market, the flag of his nation must follow him and the doors of the nation which are closed against him must be battered down. Concessions obtained by financiers must be safeguarded by ministers of state, i.e. particularly the military, even if the sovereignty of unwilling nations be outraged in the process. This is rather an astonishing statement. And you could take that statement and put it right full square with the invasion of Iraq. Because this, when we follow it up, what Woodrow Wilson then said was, colonies must be obtained or planted in order that no useful corner of the world may be overlooked or left unused. Now this aspect of the American tradition I think, and it's a continuity in, if you like, the American imperial tradition, which uh, Woodrow Wilson was crucial in identifying and which continues to this present day, that this tradition is something which needs, I think, to be addressed and looked at very much more seriously. But then there's another third issue here. And the third issue is, well, what does Bush actually mean by freedom? It's a wonderful word. But as Matthew Arnold said of it a long time ago, he said, freedom is a great horse to ride, but you've got to know your destination. So what is the destination of this freedom which Bush is concerned to confer upon the rest of the world? I think that became most clear in Iraq when in September of 2003, Paul Bremer, head of the Coalition Provisional Authority, imposed a new institutional structure of government in Iraq. And the institutional structure became more and more complex over the following nine months until the provisional authority handed over uh, power to an interim government. But basically, the basic four elements in this institutional structure were first, that there should be privatization of all assets, private ownership should predominate. Secondly, there should be no barriers to foreign investment coming into the country. There should be no barriers to the repatriation of profits out of the country. There should be absolutely no barriers to foreign trade. And the only issue that was actually interestingly kept in place from the Saddam era was the control over labor. That labor unionization was to be curtailed and strictly regulated. So that what was being imposed upon Iraq was a certain state institutional structure. And later on, as I say, it was elaborated into all kinds of things, that there would be total respect in Iraq for in, uh, intellectual property rights, that Iraq would subscribe to all of the conditions of the WTO, that Iraq would, you know, uh, would, would set up a legal s structure uh, which would be uh, sort of a favor to private property. And the economist at the time, reviewing what Bremer did, say, said, this is a capitalist paradise which is being legislated here. So this is, in a sense, what is meant by freedom. And actually, if you go back into Bush's speeches, you will find, not often, but enough times, he says, what I mean by freedom is freedom of the market and free trade. That's what I mean. And sometimes he talks about human rights and private property and the like, but it's basically free markets and free trade. Now the interesting thing about this institutional arrangement that was arrived at in Iraq and imposed upon Iraq by military force was there was a certain parallel with something that had occurred 30 years before in Chile on what the Chileans call their little, little September the 11th, which was September the 11th, 1973, when a socialist Prime Minister Salvador Allende was overthrown and killed in a coup by General Pinochet. Shortly after General Pinochet took power, what General Pinochet did, having destroyed, of course, the labor movement, all of the left-wing parties, and all of those centers of opposition in things like the community health centers in poor neighborhoods and all the rest of it, destroying all that infrastructure, having destroyed all of that, the question was, what kind of economy would you construct in Chile? And the answer came out a couple of years later, 
when Pinochet called upon a group of economists, Chilean economists, who had been trained in the University of Chicago under Milton Friedman. And these economists mandated that the economy be reconstructed on exactly the same lines as happened to Iraq 30 years later. That is, privatize everything, keep, have free open trade, foreign direct investment was welcome, no barriers to repatriation of profits, export-led development model and all the rest of it. And I think that period which starts with the coup in Chile and the experimental utilization of the Chicago neoliberal program and Iraq brackets, if you like, a whole history of neoliberal transformation of the global economy. And that neoliberal transformation has a very, very distinctive definition of freedom. And that distinctive definition of freedom is freedom is defined by entrepreneurial liberties and freedom, is defined by private property, is defined by free markets and free trade. Now this is a very circumscribed definition of freedom. And if you go back and you read an economist, uh, an economic historian, Karl Polanyi, who wrote stuff just after World War II, he made a comment about what that kind of freedom would, live, would lead to. He made the comment and said, when you reduce the idea of freedom to a mere advocacy of free enterprise, what this means, he says, is the fullness of freedom for those whose income, leisure, and security need no enhancing and a mere pittance of liberty for the people who may in vain attempt to make use of their democratic rights to gain shelter from the power of the owners of property. And I would like to submit to you that actually after 30 years of neoliberalization, this is the condition in which we find ourselves. There is indeed a tremendous fullness of freedom for those whose income, leisure, and security need no enhancing, while for the rest of the world there is a mere pittance of liberty. And indeed, many of us are struggling in vain to attempt to make use of our democratic rights to gain shelter from the powers of the owners of property. What Polanyi then went on to say, which is rather frightening, given when he was writing it in 1947, he said, if no society is possible in which power and compulsion are absent, nor a world in which force has no function, then the only way in which this liberal utopian vision can be sustained, he said, is by force, violence, and authoritarianism. Liberal and neoliberal utopianism is doomed, in Polanyi's view, to be frustrated in the end by authoritarianism or even by outright fascism. These are strong statements, but nevertheless, I think we have to take them very seriously. Now, this history of neoliberalization also has another specific origin. And the one that I'm really most interested in is another event that occurred at almost exactly the same time as the neoliberalization was occurring in Chile in 1975, which is that in the beginning of March 1975, New York City technically declared bankruptcy. What happened on that day was that the control of New York City went into his outer office and he opened a tin box in which the investment bankers usually put bids to take on the debt which the New York City needed to pay its workers and run the government. And on that morning, there were no bids. What was New York City to do? At this point, there was a complicated history. Eventually, New York City had to submit to giving up its budgetary powers to an, a new organization called the Municipal Assistance Corporation, which was run by the state and the investment bankers and a couple of representatives from the city, and eventually to something called the Emergency Financial Control Board. What this meant was that democratic New York no longer had control over its budgetary allocations. That the budget was dispersed by this organization. And in effect, what this organization decided was that they were gonna pay off the bondholders, they were gonna pay off the debt, and whatever was left over was gonna go into the municipal budget. We'll come back 
to the implications of that in a minute. Now, there's an interesting question. Why did New York City get into debt? In the 1960s, New York had been losing jobs, losing manufacturing jobs. New York City used to be the center of man a lot of manufacturing. But in the 1960s, it began to move out. It began to suburbanize, partly thanks to Robert Moses and all the new highways and all the building of the suburbs. So that the center of the city was being deindustrialized through suburbanization. It was also being deindustrialized because jobs were moving to the American South. They weren't moving to China yet or to Mexico. They were moving to the Carolinas. So the big question was, how was New York City going to support itself in the 1960s? And this was true for many American cities. And the result of that was you had a disaffected, impoverished, and very frequently racially marginalized population in the centers of the cities. And there was a lot of unrest in the 1960s, culminating in tremendous unrest in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. So in the 1960s, which was a generally prosperous period for international and national capitalism, there was, however, a difficulty. So that in the midst of all of this general kind of well-being and increase in wealth and affluence and so on, there was something called the urban crisis, which was the crisis of central cities because they didn't have enough employment to sustain themselves. The answer was largely given by a federal push to support the revitalization of central city areas by all kinds of measures, all kinds of things. The main thrust of this was to increase the flow of funds into the central cities, and with that flow of funds, cities could expand municipal services in education, healthcare, garbage, disposal, you name it, uh, transit uh, innovations, and all the rest of it. And this is what the cities were doing. And therefore, there was a shift from manufacturing to municipal employment, public employment, as being this big stabilizer of what was going on in the central cities. In order to do this, of course, cities had to borrow as well as getting money from the federal government. And the investment bankers during the 1960s started to teach the cities how to engage in all sorts of creative accounting maneuvers whereby something like a current account budget could be actually fed by your capital budget because you could borrow for your capital budget but you couldn't borrow technically for current expenditures so you found all kinds of ways to play games and the, the investment bankers taught New York City how to do that how to circumvent a lot of the, the, lot of the legal apparatus in order to go greater and greater into debt and the investment bankers found New York City debt very very uh, profitable during the 1960s in particular, and in, even into the 1970s. But in the 1970s, a number of things began to go wrong. In 1973, there was a global recession, which was accompanied by an oil price hike far higher than we've seen recently. And this created a tremendous shock to the economy. At the same time, the federal government was also having problems, financial problems, because of its attempt to have a guns and butter strategy, fund the Vietnam War and social expenditures at the same time, and it was running into budgetary difficulty. And in 1973, President Nixon came on and in his State of the Union address made the following comment, which I remember very well, I was kind of listening to it on the radio at the time. And he said he wanted everybody in the United States to know that the urban crisis was over. I thought it was great. I looked out the window and I was in Baltimore and I thought, wow, people should be dancing in the streets. We'd be very happy, you know, but it, Baltimore looked the same sort of miserable, grubby, kind of horrible place it always is, you know, and probably always will be. New York City looked exactly the same. And of course, what Nixon meant by this was it wasn't the urban crisis was over. It was just the federal government was not going to give any more money to the cities. Which, of course, was exactly what started to happen. So the federal monies to fly into the cities started to dry up. So there's New York City getting less money from the federal government. And at the same time, 
there is this economic crisis which has a dual impact on employment in general but also on the property market. The property market crashed in 1973 big time, big time. And what that meant was that a lot of the tax receipts which normally support the city government, they were falling because of the catastrophic condition of the property market, not only sort of private you know, homes and all that kind of stuff, and, but also uh, office space and all the rest of it. So that the city suddenly found itself with less money, and so it needed to borrow more. And the unions were not, the municipal unions had become very strong, they didn't behave very well in this situation, they kept on pushing and pushing, and so the city was, in effect, trying to maintain giving money to all of its unions and clientele at the same time as it had less and less in the way of resources, so therefore it was borrowing more. Many people say that is the heart of the fiscal crisis. There was another element to the fiscal crisis which was crucial, which is the collapse of the property market. Now this collapse of the property market is something that was building during the late 1960s, early 1970s. And what this meant was that the property developers particularly in New York City, were overbuilding. And they were overbuilding by debt financing. Just as the city was debt financing, they were debt financing. So all of a sudden, these buildings, which were not paying off, were not rentable, were having to be paid for somehow through rolling over the debt. And therefore, the debt in the property market was becoming huge. And at this point, this meant that there was a crisis in the property market in New York City and a crisis for the investment bankers as well who had funded that property market. So the big question was, how can you revitalize and revive this property market in New York City? And this was the big problem for the investment bankers, but also for the city. Then there is another issue. Why was it the investment bankers suddenly decided to stop lending? And this seems to me to be a question which needs to be addressed very, very seriously. Because if you look at the budget of New York City at the time, it was one of the largest budgets, public budgets in the world. It was equivalent to the public budget of Italy or France. It was huge. And actually the bankruptcy of New York City was going to create tremendous kinds of problems. And the West German Chancellor and the French President actually wrote to the American President saying, you can't let New York City go bankrupt, it will so disrupt the whole global financial system, you just can't let it happen. Federal government had to bail New York City out and therefore there was a real push on the part of many people to persuade the federal government to do that. The federal government decided not to do it. This was under Gerald Ford. And there's this famous moment when Ford sent the message to New York City that he wasn't going to bail them out. If they were bankrupt, too bad. And the famous headline in the New York Daily Post was, Ford to City, drop dead. <laughs> now, it's an interesting little tweak here. The, uh, Ford's personal advisor, you know, his aide, at that moment was none other, none other than Donald Rumsfeld, who has a great history as a destroyer of cities, when you think of it. <laughs> so the federal government wasn't going to do it. Now the interesting question was, why did the federal government not to do it? I mean, when you talk to, to Democrats in Congress at the time, they were horrified that this was going on. And they were desperately trying to, to, to push sense into them. But what was happening was the federal government at that time, Ford, and particularly the Secretary of the Treasury, a man called William Simon, who was very, very instrumental in what was going on in Chile, was also saying to Ford, don't do it, because he was talking to the investment bankers. And the investment bankers, like Walter Riston and all the rest of it, the city, were saying, don't. Don't bail out the city. Why were the investment bankers saying that? They were taking a high risk. It was a very high risk strategy. Why were they doing it? And why were they even talking to the federal government and dissuading the federal government from helping out? 
This is, it seems to me, the question. Because right now, if you, again, if you look at the aggregates of the city budget of New York right then, and all of the aggregates were incredible, heavily indebtedness uh, and, and, and all sorts of imbalances in the way in which things were being financed. And actually, if you look at the U.S. government right now, the U.S. government is in, you know, the United States is almost in exactly the same situation as New York was back then. The equivalent right now would be supposing the Chinese central bank and the Japanese central bank and the Taiwanese central bank and the South Korean central bank all of a sudden looked at each other and said, we're no longer going to lend a penny to the United States. This country is existing on over $2 billion a day of foreign support for its indebtedness. If they pulled the plug, the United States economy would crash big time. You wouldn't be able to fight a war in Afghanistan, let alone in Iraq. You wouldn't be able to run the budget deficits. We wouldn't have the consumerism we see in the United States. If they did that, this country would be sunk. It would become like Argentina in 2001, 2002. But they don't do it. And you can see why, because doing it is going to absolutely wreck the global economy. And it's going to wreck their markets and create as much problem for them. So why would the investment bankers back then decide to take this high-risk strategy? This is a story which I think is very hard to actually find out about, and I've tried to find out bits and pieces. My guess is that there were two kinds of investment bankers in New York. One was a kind of liberal democratic kind of investment banker, and the other were the right-wingers like Walter Riston, who took the view that the British government of the time was neo-communist, that indeed New York City was uh, close to being a socialist state. And he was very close to people like William Simon, who went on record as saying what they wanted to do to New York City was to discipline New York City to the point where nobody would ever try to do in New York City what had been done over the preceding decade. It was a financial coup that was launched against New York City, and it was absolutely as effective as the military coup was in Chile. Because what happened was that the financial community set up the Municipal Assistance Control and the, the Emergency Financial Control Board. They set up these institutions and made sure that all tax receipts that came in to the city went to pay them off first, and after it had paid them off, then whatever was left over was there for the municipal budget. This meant that the municipal budget, which had been yay big, was suddenly only yay big. And what this meant was the city had to lay off people, it had to cut programs, it had to cut uh, all, savage cuts on almost everything. At the same time, as almost all democratic power was taken away from the city council and from the community organizations. Now, this established an important principle, which is one of the key elements of what neoliberalism is about. And I think the investment bankers discovered this in 1975, 78, that kind of period. And that key principle is this, that if there's a conflict between the well-being and the integrity of financial institutions and the well-being of people, you choose the financial institutions. Now, this principle was taken up later and became central to what structural adjustment programs are about through the International Monetary Fund. It was what the IMF did to Mexico in 1982, what the IMF has done again and again and again and again. So the IMF, in a way, takes on that principle in the 1980s, which was discovered by the New York City bankers in the 1970s in the New York City fiscal crisis. But the New York bankers couldn't walk away from New York City and just say to hell with it. They just had to do something about revitalizing it. All that property was there. They had this thing called the World Trade Center that was empty, sort of David Rockefeller's grand dream, which is sort of standing empty. They had all of this stuff hanging around there, and they needed to revitalize the city. So their big problem was... Well, they're disciplining New York City. The city budget is really put down, and they've actually got now a situation where the municipal council cannot gainsay them whatever they want to do. And this was great for them, because there were all sorts of things they wanted to do which was actually, be, actually being resisted by democratic New York 
For example, there was a whole area which is now the Battery Park City, which had been a sort of empty area right through the 1960s. All kinds of plans for it in the 1960s, but every time developers had a big plan for it, community organizations would move in and say, no, you've got to have low-income housing here, you've got to have public facilities here, and the developers couldn't get their hands on it. After the fiscal crisis, they were allowed to do whatever they wanted with Battery Park City. After the fiscal crisis, they could start to do, it was, as it were, a takeover of the city by the investment bankers and the big developers and the bypassing of democratic institutions. But they still needed some way to revitalize the economy of the city. Now, there were two elements of this, which was very fortunate for them. The first element was this, that in 1973, as I've mentioned, there was this huge uh, sort of uh, oil price rise. And the result of that was there was massive amounts of dollars sloshing around in the Gulf states. Saudi Arabia just had incredible amounts of dollars stashed away. What was it going to do with, uh, what were they going to do with, that, with all those dollars? Sort of stick them under the mattress? No, you can't do that. The world economy would crash, you know. So what are they going to do? How are they going to recycle all of that, all of those dollars back into the global economy? Well, we know two things, and this is where the American imperial story comes in. We now know from British intelligence documents that were released last year that British intelligence had wind of the fact that the United States was preparing to invade Saudi Arabia militarily in 1973 and occupy the oil wells in order to bring the oil price down. We don't know how far those preparations went, whether this was just contingency planning or what it was, you know, how far it went, we don't know. But we certainly know that was being actively discussed within the US administration at the time at some level or other and, uh, and, and to some degree of, uh, uh, of certainty. What we do know for sure is that the American ambassador to Saudi Arabia around 1975 had a long conversation with the Saudis in which they negotiated with the Saudis that the Saudis would give exclusive rights to the recycling of all of the petrodollars which the Saudis had and then, this is going to apply to many of the other Gulf states, they were all going to be recycled through the New York City banks. That is, the New York City banks got exclusive rights to take all of that money and bring it back into the country, and, and therefore they got the business. Now, this posed an immediate problem, and the immediate problem was, well, New York City bankers now had all of this money. Where were they going to put it? They couldn't put it into New York City because the property market was depressed. The US economy was depressed. Where were they going to put it? Companies were going bankrupt left, right, and center. Where were they, what were they going to do? Walter Riston had the great idea. He said, well, we don't, lo le we don't lend to corporations. What we do is we lend to states. Because states don't go away, we can always find them. So that's when they started to lend vast amounts of money to Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Poland, you know, even African states. And so they, 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 had, they took all of this money and they sent it to places like that, Chile as well. So th this was great business. And of course, this tremendous amount of money that was now flowing through New York City ensured the fact that New York City and Manhattan in particular was going to be the center of a lot of global financial operations. I mean, we always like to think, well, you know, New York is naturally, as it were, the center of this. Well, it's not natural at all. Here's a moment when it could have gone elsewhere, things could have gone elsewhere. Uh, right now, we see other rival financial centers where the money could go, but how are we going to make New York maintain its position as the global financial center? Well, they secured that by this imperialistic gesture in 1975, and nobody quite knows whether there was an active threat against the Saudis of invasion, and which said, you, you know, we're going to invade you, and the Saudis said, no, don't do that, we'll recycle all the money through New York banks, and then they'll all keep okay. We don't know quite which, which way that, 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 that worked out. Anyway, the oil price hike was great business for the New York investment bankers. But lending to Mexico, lending to all these other countries was fine, until in 1982, Mexico went bankrupt. And it was at that point, and this is where the interesting thing comes in, it was at that point that the International Monetary Fund 
came into its own. Because if you are a real neoliberal theorist and you look at neoliberal theory, which is about keeping state out of government, then the IMF is not a good neoliberal institution. And to this day, a lot of right-wingers want to defund the IMF. So actually, you find a curious alliance between left and right on getting rid of the IMF. So the IMF is not popular. And in fact, in the first year of the Reagan administration, we now know, they were going to defund the IMF. James Baker, then Secretary of Treasury, drew up a plan to get rid of the IMF. But then Mexico went bankrupt. And then the big question was, how are they going to deal with this? Because the bankruptcy of Mexico could go two ways, just like New York City. That was, on the one hand, if Mexico really went bankrupt and couldn't pay its debts, then what was going to happen to the New York investment banks? They were going to go bankrupt. They were highly exposed. Citibank and all the rest of it, Riston's organization, heavily involved, heavily heavily exposed to Mexican debt. And it wasn't only Mexico that went under, Chile went under, Brazil was in trouble, lots of other countries were in trouble. So at that point, they invoked that principle, which I've already suggested, which is when the integrity of financial institutions is threatened or the well-being of a people, you choose the financial institutions. And it was at that point that Baker turned to the IMF and said, okay, here's a role for you, your role is to take it and suck it to the Mexican people and make sure that the money is extracted from Mexico to stabilize the New York banks. Now, this was the first disciplinary apparatus of this sort that the IMF did. In order to do that, you had to change the whole economic philosophy of the IMF. And Joseph Stieglitz, in one of his books, talks about the purge of the IMF in 1982, when they threw out all of those who were Keynesians all of those who had Keynesian views of the world and brought in all of the Chicago types, the monetarists and all the rest of it. So they purged the IMF of all of those kinds of economists, brought in orthodox monetarist economists. And then what they did was they started to say to Mexico, it's not simply that you've got to get your budgets in order and all this, but you've got to start actually introducing reform. You've got to privatize. And this was when they started to say, privatize, privatize all of those state companies in Mexico. Privatize your oil industry, privatize your banks, privatize. So the pressure starts to be put on Mexico to privatize via the IMF. And this was, as it were, the carrying out, the way in which the pilot scheme which had emerged out of the New York fiscal crisis suddenly became part of the international disciplinary apparatus through the IMF. The New York City banks had this so that New York City was now secure, if you like, in terms of a certain kind of economic base. It was going to be the economic base of financial institutions, legal services, international tax havens, all kinds of things like that. This was all going to be sort of concentrated in New York City, and from that standpoint, New York City was going to do fine. But there was something else that wasn't enough. So what happened was that the all of the investment bankers and the corporations got together and formed something called the Downtown Business Partnership to revitalize the New York City economy. And they said, okay, what's New York City good for? Well, let's think about its cultural institutions. And this is when they started really going after MoMA and the Museum of Modern Art, you know, the, the, the Metropolitan and all those other things, the cultural activities. They started to fund cultural activities. Uh, they started to push hard on consumerism. They started to push hard on, 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 on media and things of that kind. And this was when they started to insist that New York should become a great tourist destination. And this is when they came up with the famous logo, I love New York. It was a great innovation at the time. It was like selling the city as a consumer destination. And they were going to build New York City in this kind of way. Financial services, and as a destination for tourism, as a destination for cultural activities, and a center of cultural activities. This is what they were going to do. And this is how they decided to revitalize. But there's a contradiction in this. And the contradiction is this. On the one hand, you're demolishing municipal services so the garbage is not being picked up. At the same time as you're trying to turn this into a wonderful tourist destination. Now, tourists don't like to come to places where there are rats running around in the 
you know, everywhere you look and, uh, and the garbage is all over the place. So there was a contradiction here. And the contradiction was highlighted in a certain kind of moment, a wonderful moment, when the police services and the fire services got so angry at the way in which they were being disciplined, the way in which they were being laid off, the ways in which they were losing money and contracts were being reneged and all that kind of stuff, and, and they were being insisted on givebacks and all the rest of it, that they decided they were going to disrupt this I Love New York City campaign. So they organized a counter campaign called Fear City. And what they did was they produced all these pamphlets and they took them out and gave them to tourists coming into Kennedy Airport. <laughs> and the pamphlet said things like this, uh, you know, well, too bad if you're in a hotel and a fire breaks out, you should be on the ground floor because there won't be any, you'll have to jump out the windows because there's, there's no fire service is going to rescue you. And uh, by the way, there are no police forces on the street, so don't go on the subway, you'll always get mugged. Maybe you can go on the buses between 9 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, but don't go out on the street. I mean, so they launched this, this campaign. It went on for about three or four weeks, and it actually got back to Europe, and people started to write all kinds of things, and it so happened there was a number of grisly things, like this was the summer of Sam and these grisly murders in New York City, so people were getting kind of really kind of nervous about coming to New York City. So the downtown business partnership had to negotiate with the police and the fire people, and they said, okay, we're going to rehire some of you. Call off this campaign. So they did indeed rehire a bunch of police people and a bunch of fire people. Guess where they went? They were all allocated to Manhattan. The Bronx can burn down, that didn't matter. Queens, the garbage not picked up. But we start to concentrate all of these services on Manhattan. So that what we start to see here is a strategy of sealing off Manhattan as the place, which is going to be the friendly place for business activities, the friendly place for tourists, the friendly place for consumers and the like. And this has taken 20 or 30 years to come to fruition. But that is indeed where we are at in New York City right now. This history contains, I think, something else, which is another principle which I think is fundamental to what neoliberalization has been about, and which again I think was pioneered very much in this experience in New York City, which is this, that the state does not disappear, but what the state has to do is to create a good business climate. And that if there is a conflict between the well-being of a segment of the population or even a whole population and creating a good business climate, then you create a good business climate. Now this is something again has been taken over by the international institutions. About three years ago there was a whole World Bank development report which was about creating a big good business climate. That's what you've got to do in order to bring development. And that's what New York City was about. Now there's a big question, how do you create a good business climate? Mayor Koch came along and said, well, we do it by giving subsidies to all corporations to come to New York City. We give subsidies to the property developers, who by now, of course, are running riot all over the place and doing whatever they want, pretty much, throughout the city. But when you do this kind of thing, when you start to withdraw municipal services from education and from, from health care and from all these other things, and you actually start to concentrate on doing the things which are good for business, not good for people, then you start to get a very lopsided, very uneven kind of development within, within the city. So what actually we start to see in the 1980s, and it accelerates in the 1990s and is accelerating uh, again right now, is that Manhattan goes up, whereas the rest of the city gradually sinks. In the 1990s, for example, Median income increased in Manhattan about 11 or 12 percent. It declined in all of the boroughs by 1 to 3 percent. So you get this unevenness within, within the city. But one of the other things that happens when you do that is that you cast loose a lot of people. And whenever neoliberalization has struck, and this is absolutely astonishing when you start to follow this around, Wherever this kind of process has undergone, one of the responses has been immediately a massive crime wave. New York City in the 1980s was hit by a huge crime wave. 
The same was true in Mexico City after neoliberalization in the 1980s. The same has been true uh, right throughout uh, Argentina, for example. Buenos Aires now is a very dangerous city compared to what it was 15 years ago. So this then creates, again, a certain tension in the project. And in New York case, of course, it took Giuliani to deal with the crime wave, brutally, authoritarian kind of way. Again, freedom of the market will be preserved by an authoritarian kind of government. Now we have a mayor who's extremely and astonishingly interesting, Bloomberg. Bloomberg is a billionaire who pays himself a dollar a year. He has a deputy mayor, Doktroff, who's also a billionaire who pays himself a dollar a year, and they run the city. What Bloomberg says is this, I don't want to give any more subsidies to any corporations to come to New York City. And he announces straight out. He said, if there is a corporation that needs a subsidy to come and locate in New York City, then we don't want that kind of corporation here. We only want the kinds of corporations here who are prepared to pay to be in a high quality, high rent, wonderful location. Now, he doesn't say that about people, but the, actually the effect is exactly the same. That the people that Bloomberg wants in New York City are exactly those that actually David Rockefeller wanted in the 1960s and 1970s and couldn't get. That is, he wants people who can pay the high rents. So Manhattan is being increasingly turned into a kind of gated community for a transnational capitalist class, which is astonishingly affluent. Because at the same time as all of this is going on, we have these macro transformations in the financial sector. And macro transformations in the financial sector that are actually radically transforming the distribution of income in society in general. And I think these radical transformations in income distribution are having tremendous impacts on the nature of urban life. And this is true throughout the whole of the world but you particularly see it in New York City. And I think it's worthwhile just looking at some of the data on this. For example, when you start to look at the distribution of income, what we know is that the top 1% of income earners in this country have doubled their share of the national income over the last 20 years. We know that the top 0.1% has tripled its share of the national income. We know that the 0.01% has actually increased its income by something like 495%. We know that the, with the Forbes richest people in this country were worth something like $680 million apiece in 1985 and in constant dollars. They're now worth something like $2.8 billion. They've quadrupled their wealth. We know that people who run hedge funds strange organizations that push money around this way and that way and make money out of losses and all the rest of it. We know that the top earners of hedge funds last year made $250 million each. Now, in case you immediately have an aspiration to go launch a hedge fund, uh, watch out. There are too many of them around right now, and you will probably have seen, if you've been reading the financial press, that one of them lost $6 billion, $6 billion uh, in a few months uh, last year. So this astonishing amount of money that's being made, the astonishing levels of inequality, are part and parcel of what the neoliberal project was about all along. And this takes me back to what was the motivation of those investment bankers in the 1980s, in the 1970s in particular. We can see some of that motivation by the fact that in 1972, something was organized called the Business Roundtable. The business roundtable included the investment bankers, the heads of corporations, and it accounted for about half of the GNP of the United States. And their project was to make capitalism both respectable and also profitable. And so they launched a campaign. And that part of that campaign was to set up think tanks, like the Heritage Foundation, to fund all of these things. And the business roundtable engaged in all kinds of politics, 
And that politics was about the restoration of class power. And it was prepared to intervene in the New York fiscal crisis in all kinds of ways. For example, here's a little story which is fascinating. My own university, City University of New York, has 220,000 students in it, uh, in the whole system. And those 220,000 students were tuition free in 1975. One of, the one of the things that was insisted upon was that tuition be introduced into CUNY. And it was a big battle in 1978 over the introduction of, of tuition into CUNY. During that battle, a whole series of articles appeared which were supported by the Business Roundtable. The Business Roundtable actually hired independent experts to write articles, all of which proved that the quality of education was far superior if you paid tuition than if you did not. Now, you'll appreciate that. You must have very high <laughs> quality education here, right? So, that was the argument they were making. And the Business Roundtable paid for all these articles by independent experts, which appeared under the heading of just independent experts, in that radical journal called the Reader's Digest. <laughs> then, magically, all of these articles were reprinted in every college newspaper across the CUNY system. This is the Business Roundtable saying, we have to take away a right of free education. And in order to do that, we have this campaign, and we are going to be a crucial part of that campaign. Now, you would have thought the head of General Motors and Ford and all the rest of it would be interested in politics in Washington, not messing around in sort of CUNY politics and all the rest of it. But this was the degree to which they were concerned to try to transform the nature of what New York City was about and how governance was going to be there. What this suggests, then, is that back in the 1970s, and I'm beginning to find more and more documentation of this as I go through, there was a class project, a class project on the behalf of big corporations and of investment bankers and financial services and all the rest of it to try to recuperate their position. Because they were hurting in the 1970s by the crisis also, but they were politically hurt, hurting because there was a lot of opposition to corporate capitalism at that time. This was a time when students in the University of, in, in, in Santa, University of California in Santa Barbara burned down the Bank of America building and you know, buried a Chevy in the sands and all those kinds of protest movements. There was a lot of antagonism towards the way in which corporate power was being utilized and therefore there was this huge kind of push on the part of corporate power to try to restabilize the situation. And one of the ways in which they restabilized it was this. This was where this rhetoric about individual liberty comes in. Because the movements that were there during the 1960s and 1970s, the movements that were there were an easy coalition between a freedom liberty kind of strain, a libertarian strain, if you like, which was about liberate us from oppressive state power, liberate us from awful college administrators, liberate us from, from authoritarian power structures and corporate monopoly power and all the rest of it. So it was a libertarian kind of push. At the same time as there was a social justice push. And the social justice push was very strong too. It said we should have a more egalitarian society. We should try to actually spread the wealth. We should try to redistribute it across class lines, across racial lines, all the rest of it, across gender lines. There should be a push to try to redistribute in some way. And this is where the corporate elite turned to neoliberal theory, because neoliberal theory is about individual liberty and freedom. And basically what they said was, we'll try and give you liberty and freedom. You just forget the social justice. That was the devil's bargain. How are they going to give liberty and freedom? They were going to give liberty and freedom through the market. That was what they were going to do. And in, therefore, individual liberties and freedoms become significant and important. And those individual liberties and freedoms start to take us over 
in terms of what we can do as consumers, what we can do as individuals. We can have private property, all those kinds of things. We can try and make it as ourselves. But the collective vision of what the city is about gets transformed. Now, interestingly, the collective vision of New York City now lies in the hands of Bloomberg. He is very imaginative. He is transforming the city. If you look at the developmentalism going on, Brooklyn, whole of the East River, the West Side, and you know, Ground Zero is kind of much more complicated. So a tremendous developmentalism going on in the city. That is, he has a vision of the city as a whole. Our problem is we don't have an alternative vision. We are good at thinking about movements and issues within the city, but we're not good at thinking about the city as a whole. Bloomberg is. And at this point, the question of what is a socially just city comes back into play. And that therefore we have to start to think very much more in those alternative terms. Because where we've arrived at right now is that we've actually created an urban infrastructure of a certain sort and a way of living in the city, of a certain way of living, which is actually deeply part of our own political consciousness. And this comes back to one of the fundamental arguments I like to make about cities, which comes from a quote from the, the urban sociologist writing in the 1920s, Robert Park. He said, the city is man's most consistent and on the whole his most successful attempt to remake the world he lives in more after his heart's desire. But if the city is the world which man created, it is the world in which he is henceforth condemned to live. Thus indirectly and without any clear sense of the nature of his task, in making the city, man has remade himself. You have to forgive the gender bias in the quote, but you know, this was written in the 1920s. But the implication of this is that to the degree that our cities have been transformed over the last 30 years through this neoliberal program launched in this way and largely engineered by the investment bankers and the property developers and the like, to the degree that the cities have been remade, so we have been remade. We have been remade in their image. And it's interesting to reflect how much we have been remade, how much we have all become neoliberal now without even noticing it, how much we've internalized the way this world works. Because what Park's quote suggests is the following proposition. The issue about what kinds of cities we want to live in in the future cannot be divorced from the question, what kinds of people do we want to be? How do we want our social relations, our environmental relations, all those other things to be constructed? And that therefore, we should become conscious that we are part of this task. We should not allow this task simply to be left to Bloomberg and the, you know, the investment bankers and the developers and all the rest of it. We have to actually think what kinds of cities we want. But as I say, to connect that to the idea of what kinds of people do we want to be. Thanks very much. There is a, a, a microphone down here, and uh, I've been invited to invite you uh, to uh, comment, questions. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, as I listen to you, it sounds as though the private is 
inherently evil or selfish or misdirected. And that seems a little bit simple. Maybe I've misunderstood, but I'd, I'd like to hear you elaborate a little bit on the, on the pros and cons of private as such. You know, there's, um, there's an interesting history of uh, private property, for example. Uh, if you go back to the 18th century theorists like Grotius and uh, Adam Smith, uh, you find them lauding the virtues of private property, but only in the conte context of certain moral restraints. I mean, Adam Smith wrote the theory of moral sentiments before he wrote Wealth of Nations. Uh, Grotius took the view that private property was not an absolute right. But what the neoliberals have done is to transform the notion of private property and divorce it from all kind of moral restraints. And uh, what you will find, for example, in the contemporary theory, legal theory of this, is simply that any restraint on you doing anything you want to do with your private property and, you know, that legal, this legal theory would be con seen as unconstitu unconstitutional as a form of takings. So it depends on exactly how you structure the notion of uh, private property. And if you go back to uh, Polanyi, for example, Polanyi did not argue that the kinds of uh, private uh, individualism that was involved in the bourgeois era was, was negative at all. He took the view that this was the fount of certain freedoms and liberties which were very important. Uh, his problem was to stop those freedoms and liberties being confined to a very, very small group. And right now when you look at the actual distributions of income in society and you look at the concentrations and centralization of wealth in society, uh, you would argue that uh, there lies our problem. That the private property system has led to those concentrations because it's been embedded or been disembedded from any kind of social constraints. And this is what the neoliberal project was about. Disembed the private sector from any kind of moral social restraints. And this is the difficulty. Now, if you look at, again, you look at the history. Uh, Salinas finally caved in partly to domestic pressures, but also to the IMF and all the rest of it in 1988 and engaged in a massive round of privatization in Mexico. Uh, within six years, 14 Mexicans are on the Forbes wealthiest list. Right now, I think Carlos Slim is probably around the third or the fourth richest man in the world. Mexico has more billionaires than Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't know how many of you have visited Mexico. If you go there, you'll notice there's quite a bit of poverty around. You'll notice there's a great deal of informality, unemployment, misery. And yet, here is a country that has gone through a neo wave of neoliberalization and privatization of this form. So the argument is not that private property is wrong or anything of that kind. The only qu interesting question is how is private property embedded in what kinds of social restraints? It was embedded in social restraints in the 18th century. Under 18th century private property law, for example, if a starving person turned up on your land and went upon your land to feed themselves, you were not entitled to stop them. Because if it was a matter of life and death, you were not allowed to prevent their entry if it was a matter of life and death. Now this started to change in the 19th century and one of the first little things that Karl Marx wrote was in defense of peasants who were taking wood from private domain to support themselves. And the, the, the property owners were trying to prevent them. And what uh, Marx was trying to do was def defend the peasants' rights uh, to take wood from the private property in order to heat themselves and uh, have uh, enough uh, heat to survive. So, we're not talking about a situation in which we would say private property is all wrong or anything as gross as that. We're talking about exactly what kind of social system the notion of private property is going to be embedded. And that, it seems to me, is the issue. And the same is, would be true of many of the, the things that Polanyi talked about as derivative rights. For instance, freedom of speech. Uh, 
private property, of freedom of the, of the body, freedom of, uh, of, 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 of contract, things of those kinds. There are many issues of that kind which seem to me to be very progressive in what was constructed out of bourgeois history. The problem right now is the neoliberal project, which is essentially an untrammeled defense of private property, and the state only defends uh, that, this kind of uh, private property, which is free of any kinds of constraints. And what was going on in 1970s in New York City was the developers wanted to be able to develop New York City free of any kind of communal constraints. And they've been pushing very hard, and there's a continual struggle over this. I mean, over the Brooklyn project, for example, the, the Atlantic Yards, there was a struggle over it. There's been a struggle, there was a struggle over the, well, it was a different kind of struggle over the, uh, the West Side redevelopment and the Jet Stadium and all that kind of stuff. But there's, a, there's struggles over these things. But again, what we have to look at is the way in which that power is being utilized. And right now, as Polanyi kind of pointed out, we've reached a situation where freedom and liberty belongs to those who don't need it because they're so wealthy and so powerful, and the rest of us don't really have that much left to us except to do, uh, you know, go about our business within the constraints of, of how the city's been constructed. I think that leads to my question. Um, the, the real question is, what do we do? But besides asking that question, which I think you're often asked, your emphasis on rhetoric uh, I find very persuasive, but how do the tongue-tied liberals and those to the left of liberals come up with a new rhetoric, which seems to be what we need when the terms that are part of the intellectual heritage of this country have been so thoroughly absconded with and name-branded uh, in a politics that seems unconquerable at the moment. Yeah, see, I would want to defend the, the rhetoric of freedom and liberty. Uh, and my objection is the way in which it's been sort of narrowed into this particular circumstance. Um, I think one of the first things we can do is impeach the Democratic Party because uh, I think they have not created a valid opposition. Uh, they have not actually articulated the idea uh, that there is a notion of freedom and liberty which they would defend, and, uh, but uh, that they would want to put that in the context of a certain set of institutional and social and, and, and moral restraints. Um, where do we go with this? Well, actually, here is an interesting thing. That, something I didn't mention, in the same way that the urban, I've mentioned the way in which the urban has been transformed by developers and all the rest of it, we can find many examples around the world where social movements have had a very strong impact uh, upon the nature of the urban process. I'll just give one example which is fairly well known or maybe known to many of you, which is Porto Alegre in Brazil, where they have a, what's called a participatory budget system. Uh, where there is a communal process of budgeting in which budgetary decisions are decided through assemblies in neighborhoods and, and, and major decisions are made this way. And, and therefore, there is a new kind of sense of democracy. And actually, the Porto Alegre model in various ways has become very influential in certain European cities. Even Paris now has communal assemblies where they don't have the same uh, rights as in Porto Alegre where you can actually determine, the, I mean, the, in Porto Alegre, the community assemblies actually decide what the budget allocations are going to be to education or health care or whatever. They actually make those decisions, whereas in, in Paris they are advisory, but nevertheless the central, the central administration in Paris listens very carefully to these advisory, advisory assemblies in terms of what they do. So there are new forms of de new democratic institutions which are emerging in cities. Uh, there are actually uh, movements emerging in, in cities around certain, certain questions. For example, I had the privilege of, uh, when I was in Baltimore, of participating in the first uh, living wage campaign in any American city. And Baltimore was the first city to pass a living wage ordinance which said that we don't go with a minimum wage, we go with something called a living wage, which is much higher. <coughs> 
and anybody who subcontracts with the city or is connected to the city, which included all the cleaning services in the schools and all the rest of it, has to pay a living wage. Uh, we got that through the city. It took us about eight years of fierce, fierce fighting to get Johns Hopkins University uh, to actually agree to be a living wage institution. And it was not so much the university, it was the hospital system and, and, and everything else, because also Hopkins had a, quote, a private sector which was actually a private sector which was subcontracting cleaning services and they were not paying a living wage. And so we had a huge, huge battle with, with uh, the university authorities about, uh, about that, that, that question. But the result of that was that the, 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 this notion of a living wage, now there are something like 120, 150 cities in the United States, not only cities but municipalities and so on, that have living wage ordinances. And, and that this then changes the way in which people start to think about the world, you know. I mean, I mean, you can do something, and you, 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 win a winning, you win a living wage, and you kind of say, well, if you can do it locally, why can't you do it globally, you know? Uh, so there, there, are, there are transformative politics which, which are emerging uh, in cities. And New York City is kind of interesting right now because there are, um, partly as a result, I think, of the response to the Bloomberg administration, there is emerging kind of a, a different kind of communal politics uh, within the city. Uh, which, is, which is beginning, I think, to address a little bit more the whole issue of, well, what is the city as a whole about, as opposed to my neighborhood or my backyard or my special issue? You know, what, is this, what, is, what are these politics all about? So I think that, that, that there are things of that sort emerging, most of it, unfortunately, outside of uh, what is being expressed through the political parties or, for that matter, through the mainstream media. And again, you know, you can kind of say, well, you know, the interesting thing about private property arrangements, which is something that Marx long ago commented on, is that private property, uh, particularly when it's set in the context of capital accumulation, almost in invariably ends up producing monopoly power. And when you think about the concentration of monopoly power in the media, when you think about the concentrations in monopoly power in things like pharmaceuticals, uh, energy, and all the rest of it, you can, it's not monopoly power, but it's oligopolies, you know. And, and uh, you kind of look at this and say, well, you know, how about this individual liberties and freedom we're all talking about? And, you know, in individual entrepreneurialism and all the rest of it doesn't really exist. I mean, it's absolutely squashed by these kinds of massive structures uh, which have emerged out of the neoliberal era and which seems to me were part of the plan all along. Now, you can kind of say I'm engaging in conspiratorial politics here, but actually if you go back and you look at what they were talking about, what the Business Round Table was talking about in the 1970s, they were talking about exactly that. And they, they, didn't, they didn't, you know. And that, of course, then leads to the following idea, which is, you know, one which I'm sure you'll all be horrified to hear, you know, which is this, that, you know, if, if, if they launched a class project of the sort that they launched in the 1970s, and they've been incredibly successful. I have to say that if it looks like class struggle and it feels like class struggle, then it is class struggle. And then we should call it class struggle, but I have all these academic colleagues who tell me class is not a legitimate concept anymore. And I'm kind of going, well, that's a great thing. I'm sure the Business Roundtable loves you for that. <laughs> and I think this is one of the problems we've got right now, is that we, we aren't able ourselves even to talk through the analysis of this situation in a way which is going to be uh, constructive in terms of you know, really calling it like it is. To, to marketeers and, and uh, foreign capital. <clears throat> However, I would like to ask you, how will economic liberty sort of play out in China, especially when economic liberties, or as defined by you know, neoliberals, are growing so exponentially in China, while political liberties remain stagnant how is that going to play out for the development of the political system in China? And sort of in a broader, more theoretical context, uh, aren't economic and political freedom sort of linked, whether causally or on, on a correlation uh, type of relationship? And doesn't this sort of doom a lot of these neoliberal experiments to, to, to failure from the start as populations become uh, wealthier and more educated, they also demand more political liberties? Well, let me take the second part of that first because, um, I mean, there's a, there's a very complicated history between uh, you know, the whole kind of rhetoric about political liberties and uh, economic liberties. 
the neoliberal theorists took the view that economic liberties were fundamental to the protection of political liberties. And they had, I think, a very simplistic view of that. Uh, Polanyi's view was, no, that's not necessarily the case, that economic liberties uh, can, in a at certain point, turn into something that's very authoritarian. And there's an interesting kind of question that, about, you know, what's going on in China today, and um, I, I, it's kind of funny. I, I think uh, there's a certain convergence between the United States and China, uh, but it's not necessarily China becoming more like the United States. It may be the United States is becoming more and more like China. I think it's Karl Rove's dream, actually, to create an authoritarian structure at the top and then have a raging, uncontrolled capitalism at the base. And in a funny kind of way, I mean, my remark about the Democrats suggests we may have reached that point already. I mean, we have one party in the country, it's called Republicrat. And it's uh, pretty much uh, all in the pocket of uh, corporate capital and, uh, and, and, and the big, big money. And so we have a real, we have a real problem. Um, and uh, I think that actually the thing that's interesting in China I mean, I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out what the situation was in China and went there for a little bit. And I have to say, it's pretty horrific uh, what you find there. I mean, the, the environmental situation is pretty disastrous to begin with, and that's uh, pretty obvious. The astonishing pace of urbanization in the place. I mean, China consumes half of the world's cement supply and has been doing that for about the last 10 years and it's, they're pouring concrete all over the place. I mean, it's just, just uh, astonishing. At the same time as a lot of the workers who are engaged in the construction projects don't get paid because the firms that set up go bankrupt and then disappear. So they build half a highway then the firm disappears and the workers don't get paid. So there's all sorts of horrendous things happening. Uh, in, 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 in that country. At the same time as there's all these signs of incredible wealth. I, I mean, I ended up, you know, on, on, in a golf course. I mean, the golf courses somehow are very symbolic in Asia. I mean, I don't know if anybody read Thomas Friedman's last book um, called The Flat World. Well, he has this great epiphany on a golf course in Bangalore. Well, I had a similar epiphany on a golf course in Guangzhou, uh, which was an astonishing place with an astonishing clubhouse with an astonishing food and a, and, and a clientele that was a, astonishingly affluent. I mean, I just kept on being just astonished all the time. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, here you were in this, you know, and then, then you go into the factory and you find people have been working for the equivalent of $15 a month. Uh, and, and uh, with industrial injuries and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's, 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 it's really, it's really uh, pretty scary what, uh, what, 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 what you see there. But what, what, is, what is clear is that there is a tremendous increase in disparities of wealth in China. There is tremendous growth in the place. So if you look at median income and that kind of thing, yes, China's kind of, uh, you know, growth rate of 10% per year and uh, median incomes are going up, but the disparities are going like this. Uh, you know, once, once had a distribution of income that was kind of narrow like this, and now it's kind of hugely wide. Uh, and and uh, again, um, when we start to look at the data in this country, uh, you find that, uh, you know, this country, the distribution of income, it's not only this country, any place that went neoliberal, as I've suggested. You look at Britain, for example, a uh, result of Margaret Thatcher's reforms. Again, the same thing happened in, 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 in Britain. So these, these economic shifts have actually generated this incredible concentration of class power. And the result of that incredible concentration of class power is that actually political liberties become much more circumscribed. Inevitably, it seems to me, because the only way in which that class power can eventually protect itself from, quote, the mob or from mass movements of some kind is to somehow or other get very authoritarian. I mean, you look at what's going on in Latin America and you look at Chavez or you look at Morales and so on, and what you see is that when class power can't protect itself as well as it should, then you get this massive kind of movement and you see this beginnings to emerge in Mexico. And I think the last election was a point where it could have gone the other way. 
and, and, and class power in Mexico is desperately trying to protect itself. And in order to protect itself, at some point or other, it's going to, it's going to transgress political liberties. It's going to transgress the electoral system. It's going to do what they did in New York City in 1975, which is somewhere a point say, democratic New York doesn't matter anymore. You know, the city council can become just a little debating chamber. The real decisions are going to be made by municipal assistance corporation. The real decisions are going to be made over here. And actually right now we have a lot of institutions which are anti-democratic institutions. I mean, who is the IMF? Who are they? Where's their power come from? Yet they make life and death decisions for all kinds of parts of the world, Indonesia and, and, and Mexico and Argentina and all the rest of it. Who are they? Where's the democratic input? And this is, this is the kind of, kind of issue at a certain point that and, and you, 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 you come across. That, that, and this is where I think Polanyi is right, that at a certain point, if you go down this neoliberal utopian line, you're going to end up with such incredible concentrations of wealth that the only way that can be protected is, is when ideological barriers break down and we actually wake up one day and say, hey, this is not fair, this has got to change. When we start really saying that and going out there and pushing, then the anti-democratic stuff will start. And that starts big time. And I think that, that at this point, then the political liberties get pushed back. And we've seen that historically occur a large number of times, that uh, you know, political liberties are contingent, it seems to me, on the nature of the class political system and, and, and the, the, the balance of forces which exist within that system. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a bit on corporate philanthropy and the fact that um, a lot of the same corporations and financial institutions that were responsible for a lot of the urban problems you were talking about are now looked to as the funders yeah. Yeah. for improving the city. And if you could address that. Yeah, I don't, you know, it's... it's it's very hard to make a blanket uh, statement uh, about many of these, uh, some of these, some of these issues. Um, but as you, as you know, a lot of politics these days is actually articulated through the NGOs. Uh, and the non-governmental organizations, and sometimes people like to distinguish them from the GROs, which are grassroots organizations and so on, but the non-governmental organizations and the whole notion of political struggle in civil society becomes uh, very, very uh, significant for how uh, alternative politics gets articulated. I mean, in, in many respects, what we've seen under neoliberalization has been a dim diminution of the roles of political parties and the rise of civil society organizations, NGOs, and all the rest of it. Part of the corporate response to this has been to get into the NGO game. And we get uh, actually what I, we like to, those of us who like acronyms, we call MANGOs. They are market advocacy NGOs. And uh, the mangoes uh, are very much funded by the corporations. And uh, they try to bring certain kinds of market development into certain situations. Now sometimes uh, what this means is uh, that you start to utilize certain techniques. For instance, a lot of development theory in third world uh, developing country situations, a lot of that theory now rests on, for instance, the idea of private property. So you have Hernan de Soto kind of ideas. Um, he has an, is an interesting guy. I mean, he's, he's, uh, sort of, he's always depicted as an indigenous Peruvian intellectual. In fact, he was born and raised in Geneva and he got very close to Hayek and was funded by North American think tanks so he set up his place in Lima, and he then produced this whole kind of notion of, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, solution to, to, to capitalism is to, is to provide title so that people have assets. And there's been a tremendous push to try to uh, instantiate that 
through the World Bank in all sorts of projects in Egypt, uh, throughout Latin America, and so on. But the idea being that if people have full private property rights over, for instance, their house, they can always gain asset to credit. And if they can gain asset to credit, then they become part of the whole kind of uh, world of, uh, of, of, of capitalism, and this is a route out of poverty. So we have this solution to poverty is extension of private property rights uh, connected with the idea that we get microcredit institutions. So Clinton the other night uh, when he was talking to Larry King and was asked, can we solve the problem? He said, yes, we know how to do it, how to, microcredit. Well, there's some very interesting studies of microcredit institutions and uh, one of the most interesting I read recently is something by uh, Julia el Char, which is about Egypt and Cairo and it's called Markets of Dispossession. And what she points out is that actually what this is about is trying to, trying to take what she calls traditional structures of production and integrate them into a capitalist economy in such a way that you can, in a sense, suck value out of that world and bring it into global capitalist structure. It is a system of what I call accumulation by dispossession. So corporate capital frequently becomes involved in these kinds of projects. Uh, partly for ideological reasons, partly because, uh, you know, if you, if you say, well, this is the way in which we're going to reduce poverty. So the poverty reduction program assumes private property and microcredit. Uh, but if at the same time as you're doing that, you see that what this does in effect is to integrate people into the whole financial system. And through the whole financial system, you can start to gain access to their labor and their productivity and their innovative activities and all this would suck value out of it into the global capitalism and this becomes part of the problem. Now I'm not saying all corporations are doing that because yes indeed there are many corporations that are genuinely philanthropic and try to do uh, important work on, on AIDS or healthcare and uh, much of the stuff that is going on in, in, in those areas is supported uh, by corporate organizations and if you look at some of the uh, initiatives, uh, the Soros Foundation on something like uh, uh, AIDS in, in, in Baltimore, it's been very progressive and, and exceedingly helpful, you know. And if you look at uh, the, the innovations of Bill Gates and, and so on on public health. But again, there's a certain kind of uh, paternalism which is involved here, which is sometimes a bit troubling. But on the other hand, I think that, that you know, what they're doing is better than, certainly better than nothing and is very important in terms of particularly the public health initiatives. And, and I think, uh, again, it's something that I would, you know, I would hope more of them would do. Uh, interestingly, it's more, you know, when you talk about this, it's whether the corporations do it or whether the individuals do it becomes significant. So it's Soros who does it. It's Gates that does it. It's not necessarily you know, Microsoft that does it. So that again, um, you know, what they're involved in. But I think that we have to have a critical eye on what they're doing. Because as I suggested, that to the degree that we're all neoliberals now, I think you'll find a lot of these projects are not in any way thinking outside of neoliberalization. They're actually thinking about deepening and strengthening, uh, if you like, the way in which neoliberalization works at the grassroots. And therefore, it has an ideological component as well as an economic component. That is certainly true of DeSoto's projects, which seem to me, and, and a lot of the microcredit institution projects. So I think we have to be very careful about evaluating those and don't assume just because a corporation says, we have this great philanthropy and we're doing this here and we're, we're getting people out of poverty via all this microcredit and da 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 uh, I don't, don't, you know, you should uh, be a good anthropologist at that point and go in and actually do some ethnography and find out if it's really happening or not. And a lot of the time when the, you know, when, you, when the anthropologists and others get in there and look at it very closely, they find it's not happening at all. And that I think is the point. And, and actually the investigation of DeSoto's projects I mean, 1.2 million people in Peru were given uh, assets. And uh, as far as we know, the only virtue of it was uh, that uh, people who gained assets worked more hours outside the home. And this was considered a great triumph. Uh, but on the other hand, if you kind of say, well, how much did they work for? What benefits did they get? What did diminish, however, was the fact that children didn't work outside the home so much. And this was, again, considered a great triumph. But if you then say, well, what do the kids do instead? Uh, again, there's no information about that. 
So it's not as if there was an effort to school them or anything like that. So, you know, it's kind of, again, there's, there's, there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of issues. But, uh, you know, this is a, the whole kind of question of corporate philanthropy, what it's about, how it works, how much of it is going, where is it going to, and the rest of it is a complicated era, uh, uh, area of, uh, of study. And I don't think you can make a blanket conclusion about it. I'm just skeptical. Uh, about uh, some of the claims that are made for, you know, well, the solution is going to come out of the, the philanthropy of the corporate sector or the wealthy individuals like uh, Soros and Gates and so on, uh, and Buffett and so on, who have, uh, who have donated a considerable amount of money to many of these causes. Thank you. I was wondering if you would comment on the sustainability of a global oil economy in the face of rising demand for a finite resource. Sorry, I didn't get all that. Sorry. I was wondering if you would comment on the sustainability of the global oil economy in uh, the face of rising demand for a finite Sustainability resource. of a local yes. economy? Of the, of the, the global oil oh, economy. Of the global economy. Hmm? Oil. The global oil economy. Oh, global oil economy. Um, well, there's a, there's a couple of, you know, there's a, there's a couple of things. Um, first, there is the simple resource side. And uh, when I was writing the New Imperialism book, I spent a lot of time trying to go over the data about oil reserves and all the rest of it. And actually, it's extremely difficult to get any straight story uh, as to whether, you know, whether, whether we're going to run out. We know certain fields have, have, have run out, others not. You know, and one minute somebody says, well, the Canadians have all those tar sands and we can get those. And now they say, oh, it'll be too expensive to get them. Um, so the, the, there's that question as to whether, you know, just, if, you know, just by using the oil, you know, is the oil going to be there and how long is it going to be there and what's going to happen as it becomes scarcer and scarcer and all the rest of it. Uh, a more crucial and press, pressing question is really about um, fossil fuels and global warming and, and, and the rest of it because the oil economy is not the only issue. Uh, uh, the Chinese have a lot of coal, and uh, it's very dirty coal. And uh, of course, the Chinese are chasing oil all over the, the world, and this is a geopolitical struggle right now, which is having tremendous impacts on things like what's going on in Sudan. I mean, the fact that there's no intervention possible in Darfur has almost everything to do with the fact that the Chinese are after the Sudanese oil resources and are therefore supporting the, the Sudanese government against any kind of UN move. Uh, the US, which is trying to keep the Chinese out of Sudanese oil, uh, wants to declare genocide in Darfur in order to have massive intervention in the place. So it's geopolitically it gets messed up with oil. So there's a lot of that sort of thing going on in Kazakhstan and, 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 and all the rest of it. So uh, geopolitically it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's creating mayhem, but the fossil fuel side of things <coughs> seems to me to be uh, the, the real crucial question. And here it's not only oil, like I say, it's also coal and, and uh, you know, the other, other forms. And, and, and then the question arises, well, what kind of alternative energy structures do we have? And there are certain myths that, that, that are attached to this, you know, like, oh, well, we can have hydrogen, but in order to get hydrogen, you need oil. So it's not as if the oil is going to disappear out of the picture, and, 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 and a lot of the hydrogen economy, you know, would, would, would actually rest on, on, on an oil economy. The easiest way to extract hydrogen for energy sources is out of, is out of oil. So, so, you know, um, so we've got a real, real, real problem there. Um, I don't like the term sustainability. Uh, I think it's far too easy to just talk about sustainability and the definition of it varies with whoever you want to listen to. I think what we have to look at is a more dynamic kind of notion of how we are, again, transforming the world and what kind of transformations uh, are, um, are possible and, and, and with what effects and what counter effects and what hidden effects. 
and this is often very hard to, uh, to anticipate. I mean, the, the unintended consequences of a lot of the things we do uh, end up, uh, you know, who, who would have known that uh, refrigerators would create, you know, with CFCs and that would create an ozone hole. Um, and it only came out many, many years later. But then you kind of say to yourself, well, should we do away with the refrigerators? If you did away with the refrigerators, you see immediately what would happen to food supplies. And you may see immediately what would happen to public health. You'd listen to all those kinds of things. And so you've really got uh, a whole set of issues there which you need, need to look at. So I tend not to want to talk about uh, sustainability. What I would want to talk about is to talk about the resource side of oil, energy in general which is not my big field of expertise, but also match it up against the kind of human society in which, uh, in which we live. But we can clearly do a lot of things which are very different. And we can compare a economies in certain kinds of ways, like uh, I was listening to a seminar the other day and uh, everybody kind of likes to uh, go on about how horrible it must be in Cuba because uh, the poor Cubans live on rationing and they go and get uh, their, you know, their rations every, every week and they have a card and it's all kind of laid out and it's all sort of through the state store. Uh, actually, uh, I lived through rationing in World War II in Britain up until about 1949, we still had ration cards. And one of the results of that was as a kid, I never developed a taste for candy. And uh, one of the results of that was that that generation didn't have a problem with diabetes and obesity and all that kind of thing. And, the, and interestingly, the Cubans don't have that problem either. The United States has that problem. So you kind of look at it and you kind of say, well, actually, the Cubans are rather well off. Uh, in terms of the public health of their diet, their diet is strictly limited, but it's, it's basic and they, they get their basic nutrition and, and nutrition-wise, it's very good. Uh, but uh, in terms of, you know, having all these candies and the sweet pot, you know, they, no, they don't have it. So, so um, there are all sorts of issues of that kind that need, need to be addressed, which are connected to the energy side of things, because we're profligate in this country in terms of, of, of energy, incredibly profligate. And, and then, but as soon as, you know, and you can see, as soon as oil prices go up, everybody in the country wants to vote the government out, as if that's going to solve the problem. They want oil prices to come down. I mean, probably people would support the invasion of Saudi Arabia if it would bring the oil price down. I don't know. Or support the uh, invasion of Venezuela or something like that. I, I mean, this is, this, is, this is really kind of the heart of the political problem, whereby you can't really talk about these global issues without talking about actually how daily life is being lived. And I think that kind of question of how daily life is being lived uh, has to connect back to all the ways in which we're using food resources and ways we were using uh, resources of all kinds, including energy resources. So I don't, you know, again, it's, it, this is, the, and again, this comes back to how cities are organized. Uh, for instance, uh, again, you look at, um, one of the things that astonishes me about New York City is the amount of garbage that is produced through packaging. The Cubans don't have any packaging. Okay, they don't have that garbage disposal problem either. And you can kind of go on about, you know, how terrible it is they don't have certain liberties of this and certain liberties of that. But they don't have that problem. We have this huge problem of garbage disposal in New York City. It's very expensive and it's, it's getting very, very, very difficult. And on that, Bloomberg is being very progressive, by the way. So if you look at something like that and you kind of say, well, look, it's not just simply about garbage disposal. It's about the whole way in which garbage is created. Therefore, the whole packaging stuff has to be looked at, and therefore, why don't we look at the packaging business? But then you kind of say, how much of capitalism is about actually absorbing surplus capital in this needless packaging? And what unemployment consequences would flow from suddenly saying we don't want to have any more of that packaging anymore? I mean, these are the kinds of issues, and somebody's making a tremendous amount of money out of all that packaging. And somebody's now paying immensely to get rid of it. So again, the whole dynamics of capitalism is integral to this, 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 this whole question. Why have we got to the point where we've made cities in such a way that actually our food supply is structured around packaging structures of certain kinds? How did it get that way? Well, it has a lot to do with the way in which capitalism organizes and the way in which profitability is built into uh, these structures. And you make cities that way 
so that you actually accept that this is how life is lived. And you get shocked when you go to Cuba and you find out it's not lived that way. And you see people actually getting meat, you know, and then taking it home more or less in a you know, bit of paper. I mean, this horrifies most, uh, most Americans. I mean, it even horrified them in Europe, I noticed, when they go into the market and they actually see a live animal. Uh, or they see a sort of a huge carcass of a, of a, of a, a pig or something. And people go, wow, I didn't know that was where meat came from. So I, I think there's all these issues about about uh, about how we're how we're the, our di the dynamic and, and 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 you know energy is is part and parcel of that. Okay, shall we uh, we stop there? So I thank you for your questions and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>